Okay, guys, so in this last part of the, uh, or our discussion, rather, of the historiography of the late Roman Empire and the, and the collapse of the Roman Empire, what we're going to be doing is talking primarily about uh, late antiquity. And then after that, we're sort of getting into the late Roman Empire in more depth. Um, so the first three chunks of this video I have basically is a long quote from the introduction of this book. Uh, so this is The World of Late Antiquity by Peter Brown. It's published in 1971. It runs about 200 pages. And the introduction states the following. This book is a study of social and cultural change. I hope that the reader will put it down with some idea of how and even of why the late antique world in the period from about AD 200 to about 700, okay, so here we have a date, came to differ from classical civilization and of how the headlong changes of this period in turn determine the varying evolution of Western Europe, of Eastern Europe, and of the Near East. To study such a period, one must be constantly aware of the tension between change and continuity in the exceptionally ancient and well-rooted world round the Mediterranean. On the one hand, this is notoriously a time when certain ancient institutions, whose absence would have seemed quite unimaginable to a man of about 8250, irrevocably disappeared. By 476, the Roman Empire had vanished from Western Europe. By 655, the Persian Empire had vanished from the Near East. It is only too easy to write about the late antique world as if it were merely a melancholy tale of decline and fall, of the end of the Roman Empire as viewed from the West, of the Persian Sasanian Empire as viewed from Iran. So, that's his purpose here is, it's really easy just to look at this as war, chaos, and death. On the other hand, we are increasingly aware of the astounding new beginnings associated with this period. We go to it to discover why Europe became Christian and why the Near East became Muslim. We have become extremely sensitive to the contemporary quality of the new, abstract art of this age. The writings of men like Plotinus and Augustine surprise us as we catch strains, as in some unaccustomed overture, of so much that a sensitive European has come to regard as most modern and valuable in his own culture. Looking at the late antique world, we are caught between the regretful contemplation of ancient ruins and the excited acclamation of new growth. What we often lack is a sense of what it was like to live in that world. Like many contemporaries of the changes we shall read about, we become either extreme conservatives or hysterical radicals. A Roman senator could write as if he still lived in the days of Augustus and wake up, as many did at the end of the 5th century AD, to realize that there was no longer a Roman emperor in Italy. Again. A Christian bishop might welcome the disasters of the barbarian invasion, as if they had turned men irrevocably from the earthly civilization to the heavenly Jerusalem. Yet he will do this in a Latin or Greek unselfconsciously modeled on the ancient classics, and he will betray attitudes to the universe, prejudices, and patterns of behavior that will mark him out as a man still firmly rooted in 800 years of Mediterranean life. So. That's the, well, a portion of the introduction to this book. Um, so this is Peter Brown. He is probably one of the most important historians to be alive and to, and to work in the past 30, 40, 50 years. Um, he is largely credited with bringing coherence to the study of the late Roman Empire, and he's largely credited with creating the field of late antiquity. So his key works, some of them anyway, are the world of late antiquity, The Cult of the Saints, uh, and the Rise of Western Christendom, which I still, for some reason, have not finished, despite having this for a while. Um, so, basically, what Peter Brown is doing, what his field focuses on, is the following. So, in about the 1960s, uh, we have multiple names for specialists in different disciplines. So, you study the medieval period, Cool. You're a medievalist. You study the early medieval period, you're an, you're an early medievalist. Uh, you study the ancient world, you're a classicist, scholars of patristics, so these people study early Christianity, uh, we have late Roman historians, etc. Now most of these people are termed late antique scholars. So, Peter Brown and this whole field, late antiquity, covers approximately, you know, the years 200 to 700. Uh, there are some people who have argued for a long late antiquity, although this is really like an historiographical footnote, because they're arguing it goes out to like 1100. Nobody really agrees with that. So, pretty much the, the accepted dates for late antiquity are about 200 to 700. Now, what does this field focus on? 
The answer basically is like religion, cultural history, and art history. And that is possibly because the term late antiquity looks like it comes from German scholarship. Uh, so in German, this is um, Spätantik. It is almost strictly an art history term, and as far as we know, it looks like it was first used um, in 1901. By 1926, Spätantik is used to classify Coptic, so a certain style of Egyptian uh, textiles. 1935, it's used in several book titles. 1950, it's used in more book titles. And in 1945, the English translation, Late Antiquity, is used in English to catalog um, some textiles. So this is still an art history thing. In 1962, we get um, Samburski's The Physical World of Late Antiquity. So this is looking at the archaeology and some of the art. Um, and then in 1971, we get The World of Late Antiquity. We get this book. So my point is that the term Late Antiquity has a very long usage, but really it's under Peter Brown that it starts to become used more and more to the point where it basically develops its own historiographical subfield. So like I said, there's a very strong emphasis on culture, artistic developments, um, religious history, intellectual history. So not politics, military, war, stuff like that. Um, just before this is published, like literally five or six years before this is published, um, one of the most crucial trilogies on the late Roman Empire was written and put into print. And this is Jones's The Later Roman Empire, which runs between 284 and 602, so roughly contemporaneous with what Peter Brown defines as the late antique period. But these three volumes are a narrative of the period. Late antiquity doesn't really do narratives. Um, and in doing a narrative, Jones primarily focuses on emperors, military conflict, wars, kings, generals, the big flashy stuff. Uh, Peter Brown pushes against this and he views it as lifeless because his feeling is, well, if we just focus on the big stuff, then we lose sight of everything else and we risk developing a method of understanding and of viewing history that is basically lifeless which is part of why it focuses on culture, religion, etc. So, I mentioned a minute ago that uh, you know, some people argue about a, a, a long late antiquity, whether or not we should look at the cultural and, in, and you know, intellectual developments and artistic developments in this period, about 200 to 700, um, as maybe being projected farther into the Eastern Roman Empire, specifically around the Macedonian Renaissance, after which we just move into the High Middle Ages. A lot of people have issues with that, um, but what's important about Brown developing late antiquity is that because he kind of gives a, a broad chronological area to, to work with, um, this field is not constrained by dates, by, by time periods, it's not, it's not constrained by themes or ideas, so the result is that an investigation into the continuity of the Roman Empire, into the early medieval period, looking at, well, you know, these German kingdoms that succeeded the Roman Empire used Roman law codes, they used Roman titles, they had Roman aristocrats helping staff their courts, etc. It breathes fresh air into the scholarship, and it's not quite so dry and stale, but the problem is just as if you focus on wars, battles, and kings, you can run into a problem of, of neglecting other stuff. If you just focus on art, religion, culture, you can potentially run into the same or similar problems. Okay, so what are those problems? Uh, well, as you can see on the screen, I'm talking about Late Antiquity, A Guide to the Post-Classical World. Uh, that is this book. It's fairly dense. I want to say this goes to, let's see, yeah, just over, well, really just under 800 pages. Um, so this is not a narrative study of late antiquity. This is a gigantic series of essays by experts in different fields and then a general um, glossary of late antique topics. So just going through this, you know, the alphabet, Alaric, 
Ahura Mazda, I grew deserty, so all these different periods, all these different topics. Um, but the problem is that if you go through this book and you look at the table of contents, which I have outlined for you here, uh, we're looking at, you know, essay number one, remaking the past, essay number two, Sacred landscapes, philosophical tradition and the self, religious communities, barbarians and ethnicity, war and violence, empire building, Christian triumph and controversy, Islam, the good life, uh, and habitat. So, these different essays and these different entries, most of them do not deal with war or politics or anything that are primarily focused on cultural and, and religious continuity, stuff like that. Now, this same book also, like I said, contained a general encyclopedia of, um, you know, various people and various topics in late antiquity. So we have 183 entries on the Eastern Empire in this book, 62 on the West. So there's a disparity here in terms of what's covered. Um, and there's also a a problem in terms of the topics that are also written about and defined here. So we have angels, demons, heaven, hell, paradise. I could open this up and give you more. Uh, but we have no entries in this book for Anglo-Saxon, Britain, Frank, Visigoth. In the context of, you know, religious and cultural history, which stresses continuity, then it might be argued that the political collapse of the Western Roman Empire is uh, irrelevant. And certainly, the rise of Western Christendom by Peter Brown in this book also gives that idea or, or that feeling. And the problem with this is, well, if we focus on the continuity, does it maybe idealize the period a little too much? No matter how you look at this, people had to live in this world. So to live, what do you need? Well, you need food and water so you don't starve to death or die of dehydration. Uh, you need shelter, so you don't freeze to death or die of exposure. You need protection. That might mean a, a dwelling that's safe to live in. That might mean, like, armed protection. Um, you need, you know, institutions and, and structures that allow you to generally pursue your health at the bare minimum. Um, so, the primary sources that deal with the late Roman Empire in this period give us the impression that there is actually quite a lot of violence, war, and bloodshed. So despite all the beautiful religious stuff that comes out of the period, despite all the artwork, everything else, it doesn't necessarily appear to have been like a nice period for the average person. And there's been some recent pushback against Peter Brown. So what does that pushback look like? Uh, well, first and foremost, I think we have, you know, Brian Ward Perkins' The Fall of Rome, The End of Civilization, which argues exactly what you think it sounds like it's arguing. Um, it primarily looks at the archaeological material. This is actually a relatively short book. I would highly recommend it for anyone. Um, so it looks at the archaeological material. And what Brian Ward Perkins notices from the archaeological material is that the material conditions for the average individual declined drastically. Uh, yeah, people are still making stuff out of pottery. People are still doing that. Uh, but in Britain, the, the potter's wheel appears to have left. Uh, we don't really know how or why. People are eating on, on pottery as well. But that pottery is no longer ornate. They're like these crappy, monocolor, very simple plates and, and bowls. Um, because it suggests maybe people can't get what they need to beautify the stuff. They're just doing the bare minimum. Um, certainly the bioarchaeology in Britain suggests that everybody had worms and parasites and it took like twice the amount of people in the early medieval period to do the same amount of work that somebody in the higher Roman Empire could do. Um, and then we have some pushback as well, stressing the whole idea of a collapse and that the Roman Empire really did fall. So... This is The Fall of the Roman Empire, A New History of Rome and the Barbarians by Peter Heather. It has some issues, uh, mainly because I think to an extent it forces the Huns into this, like, period or, or this, this uh, historical actor role. Where basically Heather's arguing to an extent that the Huns caused it. Uh, but 
my point with this book and with bringing up Ward Perkins and uh, Robin Fleming is that maybe there's been too much of a push in late antiquity. So maybe the whole idea of like this era of cultural continuity and artwork, stuff like that, has been pushed a little too far. Maybe it's time to swing the pendulum the other way and get back into this whole idea of a collapse of the Roman Empire. And as we go through late Roman history, this is going to be basically the constant theme. Is, well, did Rome collapse? Did it fall? If it did, why? How, does, how do we go from the late Roman Empire to early medieval Europe? How do we trace this? So in the next couple videos, we're going to be gradually getting into the late Roman Empire and the development of early medieval Europe. So this is a theme that I want you all to keep in mind as we do so. So until then, I hope you enjoyed. If you have questions, leave me a comment, as always, or check the bibliography. Um, and I will see you next time.